Good morning from Washington, D.C., and a warm welcome from the Africa Center to all of our friends, colleagues, and alumni registered for today's webinar, the African Security Sector Responses to Cyber-Enabled Organized Crime. Uh, my name is Dr. Nate Allen. We have a tradition of going by first names here at the Africa Center, and I am the Assistant Professor of Security, Center, of Security Studies and the Africa Center's faculty lead on cyber issues. And before we continue with our program, I'd like to briefly turn things over to the Acting Director of the Africa Center, Dan Hampton, to say a few words. Dan, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Allen. And good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're connecting from today. And let me uh, join Dr. Allen in wishing you a very warm welcome, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. As Dr. Allen mentioned, uh, I'm Daniel Hampton. I'm the Deputy Director, currently the Acting Director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I see that we have uh, several alumni, many alumni with us today for this forum, so thank you. Welcome back, uh, members of the Africa Center family. Now, let me briefly talk a little bit about the Africa Center, who we are and what we do. We were established by the U.S. Congress in 1999 for the study of security issues relating to Africa and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. We've developed a mission statement to address this mandate from our Congress, and our mission statement is in four parts. It's to advance African security by one, expanding understanding, two, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, three, building enduring partnerships, and four, catalyzing strategic solutions. We advance this mission within the Africa Center through three main pillars. The first is our academic affairs section and academic programs. What we're doing here today with this webinar, we run seminars and workshops and webinars on topical issues, tee up case studies, allow peer learning and discussion among our peers, among our participants. Second is our research and strategic communications department. If you have not been to the Africa Center website, africacenter.org, I encourage you to go there frequently and make it a go-to resource for you. We have all our publications posted there in PDF format for free download in English and French, and many in other languages such as Portuguese, Arabic, and Amharic for some products. We also run daily spotlight pieces and infographics. So again, uh, if you're not familiar with our website or don't go there often, I strongly encourage it. It's a great resource and it, it's, we want it to be there for you and to be helpful. Our last pillar is our community alumni affairs and outreach section. And that's really staying connected to you, to being part of the Africa Center family so that we can be a resource for you. You can reach out to us, we can stay in contact with you and you can benefit from the activities and the programs, the publications and what we do here at the Africa Center. Lastly, when I talked about the fourth point of our mission statement, which was catalyzing strategic solutions, and that's really where you all come in. We hope that you take the information that you hear here today from the panelists, the great panelists that we've teed up in the discussion and the interaction that we have during the dialogue, and you can take that and make a difference within your role as a security sector practitioner. So thanks again for joining us. I'm really excited about this topic today. I know uh, cybersecurity is burgeoning as a hot topic, particularly as it relates to security and particularly security in Africa. And the linkages with transnational organized crime are clear and evident. So I think it's a great topic, Dr. Allen. Thank you for the work you put into this and the excellent panelists you have ready for us today. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dan. Um, so, now to introduce to the topic of today's webinar, and I invite our panelists to turn on their video as well if they have not. Um, today's topic builds on previous programs we had in July and August. In these programs, we discussed at length how digital technology is influencing the scope and scale of organized crime in Africa. Organized crime, which is crime involving multiple individuals, that typically span in many different types of criminal activity and countries is one of Africa's most significant and destabilizing threats. Uh, during our previous conversations, we established that there are at least three important 
cyber-related elements to the threat from organized crime. First, digital technology has led to the rise of entirely new kinds of organized criminal activity, such as ransomware games, gangs, or business email extortion networks or compromised networks, many of whom commit various forms of fraud, theft, or extortion. Second, we're seeing digital technology changing how more traditional organized crime markets like human smuggling or arms and drug trafficking are structured, facilitating greater interconnectivity between perpetrators, victims, and, and criminals uh, caught up in these, in these criminal markets, both inside and outside of Africa. And finally, we're seeing the rise of digital innovations like mobile money and cryptocurrency, changing how organized crime is financed globally and in Africa as well. The main purpose of today's webinar is to begin to talk about how to respond to these fast evolving threats, and particularly to discuss the security sector's role as part of this response. The security sector, including the military, the police, the justice sector, intelligence agencies, and other law enforcement officials, clearly has a crucial role to play in responding to digitally enabled crime, but one that is challenged by gaps in understanding and capacity, uh, changes in tactics and technologies, which seem to evolve at the speed of light, um, and also the, the novelty and, and nature of the threat, which spans borders and, and frankly crosses agencies, disciplines, countries, um, and sectors. Um, how are security sector actors across Africa responding to the threat by cyber and enabled organized crime? What role can security sector actors play as part of a broader interagency, transnational or multi-stakeholder approach to address cyber threats? And in an era of rising digital repression, how can we ensure that all that citizen security, rule of law, and human rights-based approaches are reflected in these responses? To help us answer these questions, it is my honor to introduce a group of distinguished panelists who are at the forefront of efforts to respond to the threat from cyber enabled crime within their countries through their involvement with multilateral institutions and as thought leaders. So first we have Mr. Michael Ilashebo, who is a law enforcement officer working for the Zambia Police Service as the digital forensics analyst and cyber crime investigator. He is currently a member of the African Union Cybersecurity Experts Group as well as the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers Government Advisory Committee that's responsible for governing the internet. Um, working with organizations such as Interpol, he has also worked with organizations such as Interpol and the Council of Europe to facilitate and advise cyber crime related training and workshops across Africa. Next, we have Mr. Kamal Toure who is a cyber crime project coordinator at the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, regional office for West and Central Africa. He assists countries across the region in efforts to confront cyber crime through training on digital forensics, international cooperation, and through the donation of specialized equipment, Bienvenue Kamal. And we have finally, uh, Dr. Nena Ifiani Ajufo, who is Associate Professor of Law and Head of Law at Buckinghamshire New University and Vice Chair of the African Union Cybersecurity Experts Group. She is an internationally sought after expert on issues at the intersection of law and technology, including the governance of digital technology, digital rights, and the rule of law in cyberspace. So we are absolutely delighted to have all three of you with us today. And let's begin. Um, Michael, uh, we'll start with you. And I'd like you to begin to get our sense to audience of, of what you see as, as the cyber threat landscape facing your country, Zambia, where you work as a law enforcement officer. What are the most significant threats from cyber enabled organized crime in Zambia? And what do you see as law enforcement's biggest challenges in responding to these threats? Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh, happy to be invited to be part of this important discussion on um, cyber enabled organized crime. Uh, with the coming of the internet and the increase uh, in the use of digital device on the continent, in Zambia, in per se, we faced many challenges of crimes that are cyber enabled. 
Zambia, like any other country on the continent, has been affected highly by organized crime online. Due to the borderless nature of the internet, these crime have become sophisticated and highly organized and very difficult to, to, uh, to, to detect. However, we've, we've put in measures and uh, we are still ensuring that whatever we detect, we follow up and uh, we thwart the threat. So basically in Zambia, uh, there are many, many uh, cyber enabled organized crime syndicates, but basically the major ones includes the first one as uh, cyber extortion. Um, in the Zambian legislation, uh, we have an act, uh, a section in the Cyber Security and Cyber Crimes Act called cyber extortion. Now, this is where the most common and the most dangerous in terms of uh, extortion codes extortion falls under in most African countries. So this unfortunately is most orchestrated by persons from the West African region because basically they use numbers on WhatsApp to contact their victims and uh, demand for payment or ransom for them to withhold whatever information that they have on you. In order, you know, if you don't pay them, they expose you. So basically this has proved a difficult uh, crime to fight because it also involves locals because when you are sending the money, when you are paying the money, you either pay money using Western Union or you pay money using our local mobile money system. So in this way, it actually exposes the, uh, the organization nature of which involves uh, foreigners and the locals. The second one and the most common one is uh, the financial scams, starting with the banks and mobile money. As you are aware, Zambia has adopted the use of mobile money, which somehow has made the jobs of the banks and other financial institutions a little bit easy in terms of transactions. So the trend and the system that we've witnessed in the couple of in the in, in the couple of months, or probably in the, in the past one, is that this kind of crime has become so well organized such that they are able to do a SIM replacement, compromise your login credentials to your bank account, your mobile money account, and wreak havoc to your financial uh, life. They steal money from your account. Others would go on to log into your Facebook account, post whatever they want, it, as long as they've compromised your login credentials. So basically this has affected almost everyone in Zambia. People are losing huge, huge sums of money through uh, mobile money scams under the, financial, under the financial scams. The third one is the business email compromise, commonly known as BEC. This is one of the most highly organized crime syndicates, which has wreaked havoc also on the financial sector, especially to, to do with companies those who buy their product and order the products abroad. This has caused many companies lose, lose huge sums of money. If lightfully followed, you discover that it's not a crime that is conducted by a single individual, but it's highly organized as well. During the, nine, during, during the COVID-19 era also has seen an increase in ransomware attacks on small organizations. Um, most small organizations have actually faced ransom attacks because of the uh, increased work, work, work from home system where you are required to work from home. So basically, we've reached a stage where the system is compromised. You cannot access the system or your, or your database or whatever system or mechanism that you've put in place. At the end of it, or you end up being locked out. And due to lack of registration in terms of managing some of these issues, some of these uh, cases go unreported. The, the fourth one, if not the fifth one, is uh, human trafficking. Human trafficking has taken another form via organized crime. Basically, if you go online, some pages, some universities, some institutions have their pages been replicated. And people are easily fall for these. They would call for scholarships, they would call for jobs, abroad, the unsuspecting would actually fall free. They will apply for a passport to travel to this country and they end up being trafficked for sex or any other illegal business out there. So basically, if you look at all these, these are a sign that crime 
has reached a stage where technology has become a major enabler when it comes to the commission of this crime. However, in as much as the law enforcement uh, family is trying to ensure that these crimes are brought to minimal levels, we can't stop them, it's a fact, but we can actually mitigate them. There are many, many, many challenges that we have faced as a nation and also, I believe, as a continent as well. So among us, the biggest challenges that we as law enforcers face in dealing with these threats include one of the major ones is jurisdictional issues. These, backda, these bad actors online are mostly situated in areas or outside the legal jurisdiction of Zambia. Despite the presence of mutual legal assistance agreements with other nations, the problem still exists as the rate at which African nations are enacting cyber laws is very slow. As a result, you find you have a mutual legal assistant with this country and this country has no cyber laws. So it's, it, it's, it, it becomes a little bit uh, difficult. The second one is the issue of um, monetary threshold issues. Now, this most affects the relationship between African countries and the European countries. This has become, it has become almost impossible to pursue the recovery of stolen funds from a suspected cyber criminal based in Europe due to the limit of amounts our colleagues in Europe are able to follow up. I'll give an example. Uh, probably the minimum monetary threshold of a case they can follow is $50,000. But if a cyber uh, criminal in Europe manages to steal $5 from each person in each country for maybe, maybe he steals $1,000 in Zambia, he steals $1,000 in, in Angola, $1,000 in Egypt, $1,000 at the end of it, or he has about $30,000. And you know this person, you have all the evidence but if you push the case as, as a country to ensure that the person is arrested and the money is recovered, the money becomes, the issue becomes issues of monetary threshold because the amount involved, they cannot follow, it's, it's too low. But $1,000 stolen from a victim in Zambia is a lot of money to us, but not to the, to the European system. To them, $1,000 is, is not as much as it is in, uh, in Zambia. The last one is uh, capacity building. At the moment, our agencies need increased capacity building to enable us to handle these vices. This includes the whole justice system from law enforcers, prosecutors, major streets, and judges. We cannot investigate a highly organized crime with the technology you have as a law enforcement agency, and yet the person who's going to prosecute them, uh, that, uh, that crime lacks the capacity to understand the technological advancement and the technological nature of how it was organized. So basically, we are looking at it in the sense that when training is conducted, it involves all the people that are involved in the wheel of justice. There is a serious need to develop also a serious response mechanism for us to mitigate and fight these cyber-enabled crimes. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that really, really comprehensive response. I think it's made abundantly clear how increasingly central technology is to become to be facilitating a crime, especially financially based crime, and how difficult it is for law enforcement to keep up with what the cyber criminals are doing, especially given yes. the globalized scape, scope and scale of the script. So, so second question to you, if you could be pretty brief here, but, but this is important. Um, what is Zambia doing to kind of respond to this threat? What specifically are, uh, to, 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 the, to our topic of our conversation today, what specifically are the roles and responsibilities of the security sector in Zambia in addressing cyber-enabled crime? And if you, could, if you could tell us maybe a lesson or two you think other, other African countries could learn from Zambia's approach, I think that'd be great for our, our audience. Uh, so basically, I will give a short, brief background, a very short one on the Zambian uh, scenario when it comes to dealing with uh, online crimes. So basically, uh, Zambia first had its own cyber law way back in 2003. It was called the Computer Misuse Act, which was enacted in 2003 and repealed in 2009. It was now incorporated in what is what came to be known as the uh, Electronic Communication Transactions Act. Number two of 2009, we is now that is where now all major cyber crime, uh, crimes were prosecuted from. So basically, last year, as of 2021, 
we expanded our legislation to now free of the, the ECT Act and introduce further crimes, standalone crimes like the Cyber Security and Cyber Crimes Act, also the Data Protections Act. So basically, one major reason, one, one major aspect in which Af other African countries are able to copy from our successes is that we need to keep um, amending our registrations. We need to ensure that we 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 face crime as it happens in terms of uh, enacting of new laws. So one of the major route we've taken is the one for enacting uh, laws based on what is prevailing on the ground. The second one, of course, has been the issue of um, to do with interagency cooperation. As you are aware, in Zambia, uh, cybercrime is not fought by the police itself alone. There are many other agencies which at some point during this discussion, I'm going to discuss and uh, uh, bring to perspective each agency's law in terms of fighting cybercrime. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So I, I think that's a really, really helpful kind of point that, that in order to be able to effectively fight uh, a crime, any kind of crime, you need to be able to define it. And I, I think we're, we're even at a stage where some forms of crime are growing so rapidly and some legislative responses are so, growing, are so slow that, that some crimes that exist aren't currently on the books, which of course makes yes. it a huge, huge problem to, to combat. I think that's a really, really excellent, excellent point. Um, let's go next. Let's bring in you, Kamal. Um, you work with security sector officials to manage the threat from cyber-enabled organized crime across Western and Central Africa through your role with the UNODC. So I'd like you to add a little bit to what, what Michael said and reflect on the kinds of roles and responsibilities and good practices you're seeing within the security sector in the regions that you work. In your view, what should the security sector's role be as part of a broader multi-stakeholder approach that, that Michael mentioned that, that needs to involve multiple agencies um, and, and multiple different actors uh, in combating cyber-enabled crime? And are there any success stories or good practices you'd like to highlight from the UNODC's work? Merci beaucoup. Uh... Thank you very much, Dr. Nate. I will begin where Michael finished uh, by highlighting the fact that in a particular country, you usually have several institutions or agencies that fight against cybercrime. And if you don't pay attention, you can end up with a lack of organization, a great lack of organization, and actually you can end up wasting resources uh, within the country. So for me, the question, the answer to your question is first collaboration. So the agencies within a particular country fighting against cybercrime should collaborate among themselves in such a way that they can actually pool their resources, uh, share their equipment and, and share human resources, and as well as share information so they can be effective. We know that cyber crime is a rapid crime and, and a crime that requires a lot of technological resources when you want to fight it. And if each agency just holds on to its little share of the power and doesn't collaborate with others, then you, you have reduced effectiveness and efficiency. So I, I would advocate for strengthened cooperation between the services that apply the law. And so between these agencies first. Now in Francophone countries, I'm sure you know that in Francophone countries, we have the police and we have the gendarmerie that doesn't exist in anglophone countries but even in anglophone countries you have several agencies that are fighting cybercrime so between these agencies departments that apply law you must have collaboration but you also have to have collaboration between these forces that apply the law and the judiciary sector the judicial sector as as we know uh, cybercrime is is a technological crime and technology evolves very quickly. So this, this, every year there's something new uh, that comes out. So 
you have to keep the pace. You have to be able to, to keep pace with these developments in technology. Unfortunately, magistrates, judges, they're not technicians. They're not IT people. They, they don't know about this. So it takes them a long time to catch up. And the criminals are still moving faster and faster. So in order to face this challenge, the, the, the police and, and the services that apply the law, when they submit cases about cybercrime to a particular magistrate or judge, they must carefully explain to them how they acquired evidence and how the case unfolded. So more concretely, now when we talk about electronic evidence, we know that nowadays an increasing number of countries have laws that uh, make it possible to um, apply a certain value to electronic evidence in, in a court. But these laws are pretty recent. And what's happening nowadays is that in many countries, judges, magistrates don't know how to verify that the electronic evidence they have been given is actually valid. And, and yet, you know, the, the integrity of if evidence is fundamental when you render a judgment. So if these magistrates and these judges have a, a problem establishing the validity of these electro this electronic evidence, uh, then it is the role of the services that apply the law that, that, that need to help these magistrates uh, to validate the integrity of electronic evidence so that it, it is not these evidences are not rejected by courts. So um, what UNODC tries to do as a good practice is that when we organize training, we involve everyone. So we organize training where we invite uh, police forces, the gendarmerie, and all other uh, department services that fight against cybercrime so that these individuals learn to, to meet each other, learn to know each other, so that even within a, a single country, these people may not know each other. So they this, una this enables them to uh, learn to know each other, to talk, and to establish a, a quicker form of cooperation. Another example uh, to finish up is as a good practice, a best practice in Burkina Faso. There, a few years ago, there was the creation of a central brigade on the fight for cybercrime, and which she, which brought together all the um, law enforcement departments fighting cybercrime so that there was no longer several entities all over the place. They were bringing together a single entity that reports to the Ministry of Justice, I think. And within this, you have the gendarme and people from other services, and everyone is under uh, one umbrella in this fight against cybercrime. So here is my answer to this question. It's really collaboration is what's important. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that I think really resonates with exactly what uh, Michael said about sort of the international scope and character of the challenges posed by the organized time of criminal threat making uh, international cooperation really, really imperative, but also one of the biggest challenges when it comes to addressing cybercrime and organized cybercrime, especially for under-resourced African countries who may not have the capacity or the finances, and, and just a very different perspective from what we find in more technologically dependent, developed to technology dependent places in like Europe, the United States. So I, my next question is, is to, to hone down a little bit more on this aspect of international cooperation. Um, you know, uh, when it is possible for, you know, criminal actors in West Africa, as we heard from Michael, to extort money from people in East Africa, or really all over the world in, in small amounts at a time, you know, cooperation isn't optional, it's necessary. So 
how in your view, kind of building on some of the these informal maybe groups that, that you've talked about, you've helped to establish, how can security sectors across Africa um, best cooperate with one another to address specifically the transnational elements of the cyber criminal threat, um, you know, building on highlighting some of the some of the best practices you and you and Michael have brought up already. Uh, thank you, Dr. Allen. In terms of best practices in international cooperation, there is what we call a request for uh, legal assistance that are established and a means through which a country can uh, go to ask for cooperation on legal issues, whether it's an investigation or any other issue with a legal um, aspect. The countries uh, have focus points and through which they can make requests for legal assistance. In addition, there are treaties of cooper international cooperation, uh, treaties that are signed by different countries, interagency cooperation and coordination that is done by Interpol. And these are channels that people can use to um, enable international cooperation uh, when it comes to cyber criminality, when there are investigations underway. But the problem with this international cooperation, this official international cooperation, it can be very slow. It can take days or even weeks and even months without exaggeration. exaggeration. Sometimes to receive a response from a country, it is not unusual to hear uh, even between African countries that some countries request information from other countries and do not get a response. It is not rare either that in terms of legal cooperation, this can take weeks before one can receive an answer. The concern with this is when we speak of uh, cyber criminal, cyber crime, the cases of extortion, for example, or even cases of of mobile money, attacks on mobile money. These are things that need an immediate, fast response. If not, the criminals disappear in the ether space. So it's very important to get answers from countries um, quickly. And another solution in terms of this problem is what we uh, look at, speak of as informal cooperation. In a, this is done between agencies that fight against cybercrime. But for this informal cooperation, for it to function, people need to know each other. When you have, for example, uh, an investigator uh, who's at the head of a, a cyber crime unit in Zambia, for example, if he is uh, taking on an investigation in while he is asking for uh, official legal assistance, he could ask his his um, his counterpart in Senegal, if he's, that's where the uh, investigation is, and he can send him a message, he can speak to him informally uh, on a secure channel. And this will allow to get information much more easily. And maybe these individuals know each other, maybe they've met before, and this will establish, help to establish um, the, it's important to have trainings, regular regional trainings, workshops, so people can meet each other where we bring together the different actors in the fight against cybercrime from different countries. Unfortunately, for the last two years with COVID, it's been extremely different, difficult to um, organize uh, or meetings in person, so we've had to do it virtually. It is less efficient, but it does function. And so at the end of these um, trainings, these meetings, we try to organize um, 
uh, forums by which people can exchange uh, contact information, they can stay in touch, and that way when they need information quickly, they can contact their counterparts. For example, I can give you one to indicate how this functions this week even. I think it was last Tuesday, I was contacted by an officer of the uh, cyber crime unity of a country who recalled uh, participating in a workshop where there was an official from another country. And so he had asked for the contact information and asked permission. I asked the permission of the second one to share his contact with the first. I received permission to exchange the contact info and they were able to uh, communicate and quickly deal with the issue at hand. So that is how we try to deal with uh, the, the slow pace of international cooperation because, and of course, serious investigations do take time, but this allows countries to cooperate uh, uh, in the long term. But in the meanwhile, we do call on countries to organize themselves, to find means to, uh, to uh, communicate internationally much more rapidly, to keep the pace with the cyber criminals who are very quick and to uh, better uh, be able to counter that. Thank you so much. No, thank you very, very much. I think it's very, very clear from your remarks that, that kind of what needs to happen, first of all, is that more formal uh, collaboration mechanisms need to become quicker. But uh, in the meantime, informal coordination mechanisms need to expand to enable some of the, you know, enable to respond to some what are really, really rapidly evolving threats. So it's great to see all this work going on at UNDC. This is some of what we try to do here at the Africa Center well is facilitate informal networks of law enforcement officials and officers who can help each other and cooperate and collaborate to address transnational uh, organized criminal cyber threats. Um, so now I'd like to bring in, in you, Nana, and, and, you know, Michael highlighted, I think, I think, uh, 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 Kamal, too, highlighted that one of the key challenges here isn't just international cooperation, but cooperation within the security sector itself between the police, uh, the military, and in your kind of area expertise, the judiciary. And there can be difficulty in getting agreements on the categories of cyber-enabled crime, on evidence collection and admiss admissibility standards, on the legal assistance, and on interagency coordination. So I'd like you to, to, to help us discuss a bit what in your view are the key challenges in Africa that, that security sector, law enforcement, and justice sector officials face in working with one another to address organized cyber-enabled crime? And in your view, what are some good practices in overcoming these challenges? Thank you so much, Nate, and thanks for the kind invitation to join the discussion this afternoon. Like you highlighted, in fact, yourself from the introduction, you touched upon the nature of some of these crimes and how they um, affect not just national jurisdictions, but in fact, the entire African region. So you find that, you know, the cyber threats from state and non-state actors, and in fact, cyber criminals are continuing to grow as modern technologies advance and these threats are not respecting borders. So, you know, beyond international cooperation, like you mentioned, it is important that these sectors become more conscious of working together towards common objectives. However, particularly from an African perspective, there are many factors that need to be taken into consideration when assessing the capabilities of these sectors, the security sector, law enforcement, and justice sector officials to cooperate in the African context. There are technical, operational, and legal challenges to coordinated and efficient approaches to address cyber-enabled crimes. Beyond that, you must also think about human resources, skilled personnel, processes and procedures in place, political issues in Africa. You know, you have to think about the fact that we are still having coups and all that in Africa, knowledge and awareness, and even the digital capacity. By far, Africa remains the least digitalized region in the world. So you find that understanding that technology is evolving has been a huge challenge. It is important to understand that you cannot address cyber-enabled crimes in the same way you address traditional crimes. You cannot address virtual theft in the same way you would address traditional theft of breaking in and entry. 
So these crimes do not also respect boundaries. In fact, you find that new technologies and strategies are preventing law enforcement and justice agencies from executing law court orders, investigating cyber enabled crimes, and even securing electronic evidence. You are seeing digital solutions that are being developed to prevent the discovery and collection of information you know, from digital devices. And so we must understand that you know, we need to develop our digital capacity and capabilities in Africa, and this is a huge challenge. And that is why I'm usually, each time I speak, um, I say that I am impressed um, by the African Digital Transformation Strategy 2020-2030, which recognizes the importance of cybersecurity and how African states must develop digital capacities in that line. Certain African countries like Nigeria have followed to develop a national digital strategy as well. Another challenge you have is the capacity to facilitate data-driven law enforcement, and in particular, real-time data sharing in Africa. So the lack of digital capacity also trickles in this sector. And it is a challenge that many countries do not have national data protection laws or strategies, very few. And sometimes when you even see them, you begin to look at the capacity to implement. And so it makes it an exercise in futility when you even have those data protection strategies. So increasingly, the nature of cyber crimes makes the swift and efficient availability of data essential in modern law enforcement, of course subject to appropriate safeguards. So the ability of law enforcement agencies to conduct point-to-point -point data exchange is critical for developing lines of inquiry, identifying suspects, and even informing appropriate action. African member states must dedicate resources to the development of relevant frameworks and commit to developing skills and expertise in this area to enhance multilateral data exchange and centralized data storage. We must understand that analysis and dissemination of data are invaluable. Another issue which I see across African states is a lack of practical operational control, um, practical operational cooperation amongst these sectors. And Kamal touched upon this as well. Now, while effective methods for sharing and analyzing law enforcement data are crucial, in initiating action. It is also vital to be able to implement, you know, streamlined processes for practical operational cooperation amongst these sectors. And what do I mean by this? You'll find that investigators and prosecutors greatly benefit from defined streamlined and clear processes that allow for collection of evidence, arrest and transfer of suspects, and even enforcement of penalties. So we must provide valuable platforms from, for liaison across the sectors. It must be conceptually clear what they can do in particular instances related to policing or addressing cyber-enabled crime. Or you find that there is a tilt in one sector and other sectors are not clear as to how to address these issues. And that is why national cybersecurity strategies are important. I attended a conference um, in January. There were delegates from various countries in Africa and most of the countries noted that they did not even have national cybersecurity strategies. And so it's important. Another issue is the lack of the ability to work with private sectors and even a non-reluctance. Why I say this is sometimes you find that the tech companies, for example, have the necessary cyber skills or technical skills, which you do not find amongst security actors. So it is also important that we begin to involve ICT stakeholders, ICT security companies, experts, developers, civil society organizations. Governments should be responsive in creating an environment that supports private sector's initiatives and seeks to establish mutual aid assistance by reducing regulatory obstacles. We can also develop toolkits. Article 26 of the Malabo Convention reminds African states to be mindful of the need to mobilize all public and private sectors, including local communities, enterprises, civil society organizations in addressing cyber enabled crimes. Computer emergency response technology is a challenge in Africa. It's a huge challenge amongst these sectors. In Ghana, for example, you have the Cyber Crime Act allows for intersectoral development of sets. So you have sectoral sets. I think it's important that these sectors are 
enhanced in a way that they can also develop computer emergency response technology in all fields. I won't finish without speaking about legal frameworks. It is very important. An important challenge in Africa is the legal framework and even outdated legal frameworks. And this does not encourage, you know, working together amongst the sector. We do not necessarily have that harmonized approach when it comes to addressing cyber enabled crimes. And this is evident when you look at the fact that many African countries still do not have cyber crime or cyber security legislations. African countries are reluctant to um, ratify the Malabo Convention. African countries are reluctant to um, ratify the Budapest Convention. Convention. If you look at Article 23, 24, 25, 27 of the Budapest Convention, it touches upon international cooperation, it touches upon principles related to mutual assistance, just like you listed out, Nate. It talks about extradition, and in fact, the new protocol focuses on electronic evidence. Without regional and international cooperation, cyberspace is not tied to any geographically proximate location, and no state can boast of effectively and efficiently addressing cyber enabled crimes without cooperation, whether interstate, regionally, or internationally. So we must think of ratifying regional agreements and international agreements to facilitate cooperation, mutual legal assistance, and law enforcement internationally, and even nationally across the relevant sectors. Thank you. Wow, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of identifying key gaps in capacity, in coordination between and across sectors and uh, from a policy and legislative framework as being huge deficits that need to be overcome in order for security sector actors to effectively work together uh, to address uh, the threat. Um, I'd like to begin to ask our, our, our participants to put questions in the chat so we can soon turn to the Q&A session. We also have a, a Zoom poll question I'd like to get to. But before that, we already have one question in the chat on this. Um, you know, there, there's no disputing that that security sector actors are essential uh, to responding to the threat from cyber enabled organized crime and in many respects need to up their game. Um, nevertheless, as you mentioned, and I think as, a, as an audience member has also mentioned, uh, we're living in an era when coups and authoritarianism are on the rise, when some of the ways in which governments and politicians across Africa are, are justifying seizures of power and, and increasing kind of authoritarianism is through cyber threats and, and vaguely defined uh, cyber legislation and other types of extraordinary or oppressive laws that in my view both undermine democracy and political stability. So kind of as a final question to you, Nana, are there any risks and externalities that stem from security sector involvement in addressing uh, organized cyber enabled crime? And how can we ensure that security sector actors uh, respect both human rights and the rule of law uh, to one of our panelists' questions as they address this very, very important and rising threat? Thank you. Thank you so much, Nate. And this is a topic I absolutely would never stop um, speaking about. Of course, it is inevitable that the security sector should have such a role, particularly considering the nature of ICTs. Organized cyber enabled crimes touch upon security. However, the challenge you have and we are having in Africa is this obvious over militarization of the approach. You know, I, I, I say sometimes that I find that African states have made cybersecurity their own issue. They've, they've become so selfish about how to address cyber enabled crimes. And so you also find that every issue related to cyber enabled crime is sometimes treated as a national security issue and it affects mandated commitment to individual liberties and the recognition that human rights are fundamental. Of course, when national issue, um, national security is stated by a state, it becomes a non-justiciable alibi, particularly in Africa. Nothing can happen after that. So it also prevents security se sector from adhering to constitutional protections. So in many instances, as you're seeing in Africa, states then restrict, control, manipulate, and censor content disseminated via the internet without any legal basis, and in a manner that is clearly unnecessary and disproportionate without justifying the purposes of such action. 
I always say that you know cyber enabled crimes are not always focused as an attack on the state. You have victims' responses as well, which should be acknowledged by African states, and it's not being tackled as it should. Secondly, you also have a blatant refusal to work with other sectors. The nature of cyberspace must cause us to think of responses that must transcend the national notions of security. Traditionally, of course, governments play the primary role in creating the public policies and laws that regulate and determine cybersecurity measures. But domestically, many times you find that there is a non-governmental impute. While governments must create and develop cybersecurity initiatives, it is also important to consider technical experts, private businesses, and I touched upon this when answering the first question, and even civil societies for recommendations on how to improve strategies. Why is it important? Now, private sector companies, including ISPs, are crucial because of their role in creating and maintaining technologies on which cybersecurity issues arise. And they tend to profit from human rights infringing cybersecurity policies as well. So if they are involved, it creates a sort of balance that focuses on a people-centered approach. The technical community has the technical expertise and understanding of the internet and is often cited by governments, for example, in the global north when developing cybersecurity policies. Civil society is also uniquely positioned to advocate for cybersecurity policies based on a human rights approach, and they can play an important role by monitoring and documenting governments and business practices. They can identify knowledge gaps, hold governments accountable, and even provide um, forums for policies and relevant discussions with citizens. So by developing knowledge and ultimately enhancing collaboration and dialogue between civil society, security sector can approach addressing cyber-enabled crimes on standards that safeguard human rights. Another thing I would highlight is the fact that established legal processes require a balance between the use of ICTs and the protection of human rights of citizens. And by established legal frameworks and processes, I mean international human rights frameworks, regional human rights frameworks, and even national and constitutional human rights framework. The recently released UN norms on responsible cyber behavior also relates to state actors like the security sector and requires that states balance human rights obligations in how they address IT security issues and cyber enabled crimes. Now in July 2012 and since then till now, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations has confirmed that the rights that people have offline must also be protected online. In the same way we respect human rights offline, we must respect them online. So it means that human rights declarations such as the U uh, Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights are all applicable to the internet. The standard now is that international law is also applicable in cyberspace and standards that are related to human rights are also the same standards online. The GGE reports also have concluded, amongst other things, that increased need for international cooperation against threats in the sphere of ICT security requires input from civil society and private sector, but also emphasized that state efforts to address the security of ICTs must go hand in hand with the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. In fact, coming down to Africa, the Malabo Convention also requires governments to uphold the African Charter on Human and People's Rights in addressing cybersecurity, the Malabo Convention is the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. And Article 25.3 is explicit and unequivocal. So there must be checks and balances on the security sector to ensure transparency and accountability. The security sector should not be seen as being above the law. So while they make policies, however, Policies related to cybersecurity can also undermine human rights. So whether offline or, or online, states have the primary duty and obligation to protect fundamental rights and state actors like the security sector must be seen as doing that. Now, how can the security sector actors ensure their interventions respect human rights and the rule of law? In determining whether an interference with human rights is to be justifiable, Cybercrime policies and legislation must stipulate when there would be an interference. Number one, the interference must be in pursuance of a leg legitimate aim. Number two, it must be in accordance with the law. Number three, it must be necessary in a democratic society. And I'm believing that the African um, continent is democratic generally. 
if the state cannot satisfy any of these conditions, it will be a violation of human rights guarantees. The policy strategies and approaches must also meet the test of necessity, proportionality, and foreseeability. Citizens should be in a position to foresee with a degree of accuracy the circumstances in which they may be uh, subjected to such exercises of such powers. So I will emphasize again that a general power to take steps for policing cyber enabled crimes is not a sufficient basis to take away human rights. It is necessary that national laws contain provisions concerning the precise, precise circumstances under which human rights can be interfered with. Of course, while government's interference may be necessary in certain situations, however, it is important that such measures must definitely be necessary, proportionate to the aims that is being sought and must be achieved in terms of addressing cyber enabled crime. So there is no problem with security sector being involved in addressing cyber enabled crimes, but it should be done within the confines of understanding that human rights are fundamental, they must be promoted, they must be respected and importantly advanced in all situations. Thank you, Nate, thank you. Thank you very, very much. That was a truly, that was a tremendous response. I think that points the importance of taking human rights seriously, recognizing that, that it's citizens ultimately that need to be at the core, uh, are the core beneficiaries of our cybersecurity policies and strategies. So always kind of the fist of the state needs to be balanced with respect for their interests, their needs and, and, and their rights. Um, uh, we have a limited amount of time left and I, I still have a Zoom poll to get to. So what I'm gonna do is I want to, um, and all of our panelists are going to have have a, an opportunity to, to answer any question they would like. I mean, I'm going to do the Zoom poll. I'm going to ask a couple of the questions that have already been asked by the some of our participants, because I know there are a lot of questions coming into the chat. And we'll get at least one more round in, hopefully two more rounds in for each of the panelists to uh, say whatever they want to say and, 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 to, and to respond. So, um, First, you should so so to our audience now. You should see a live Zoom survey populate your screen. The question and answers are simultaneously written in English, French, and Portuguese. And the question asks, "What is the greatest deficit security sector officials in your country or region face in responding to cyber-enabled organized crime?" I think we have we have covered every single one of these in some sense today. Um, and we're going to do something difficult. We're going to ask you to select one. Because I know these are all probably issues in in your country or region, but we want to help our, our audience and ourselves get a sense of what what in their view is the most significant uh, challenge cyber related challenge in responding to organized cyber enabled crime security sector actors face so please select your response and get it in on a mobile device with touch screens, you should be able to do this by touching the appropriate response, which will appear highlighted um, and will We'll see the results hopefully momentarily. I'll, I'll summarize them and I'm also going to get in a few other other questions that have already been asked because we already have a robust response and that then go go through each of the panelists one hopefully two more times. Okay, so we have a nearly unanimous consensus among our participants that, or pluralistic consensus, shall I say, that that uh, over 50% of participants agree that capacity is the biggest challenge with roughly even numbers of participants. Uh, stating that cyber awareness, interagency cooperation, interagency international coordination, and a lack of legal and policy frameworks are challenges as well. Great, that is a really, really interesting, fascinating result. Um, so I'm going to ask a few more questions and then and then go to, to our, our panelists. Um, one question I thought that was really, really great um, that I, I think deserves to be answered is, is one participant uh, asked, um, you know, seeing that, that the Malibu Convention that most of you, most, 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 many of you have mentioned, addresses at least some of the challenges, particularly with international cooperation we've highlighted today. Um, why aren't more African states adopting the Malibu Convention? Oh, and what, what, what efforts are being made, if any, to encourage uh, African countries to adopt the Malibu Convention? That's, that's one uh, question. Um, another question specifically for Kamal Toure. Kamal is, you know, when it comes to judicial actors, what are the precautions taken by the UNODC to uh, prevent human rights abuse in the, in the formation of judicial and political policies? Um, speaking to some of the, the, um, the, the manipulation of, of, of legal issues, you know, passing vague cybersecurity legislation, um, um, you know, vaguely defined 
crimes that, that enable the security sector to kind of act pretty repressively and, and broadly. So, so what is the UNODC, I think, doing to address that is, is, is one of the questions. Um, another question is, um, um, how, what are, what are the differences on the regional level? Are, are certain regions or countries in Africa better prepared in terms of the human, technical, and financial resources to respond to cybercrime threats uh, than others? And then the other, the other point I'll just, I'll add before hopefully doing one more round of questions and again, letting you respond is that a lot of panelists, a lot of chat I'm seeing commending uh, each of you in various ways for highlighting that this is not just a, a security sector issue, but you know, cyberspace is different. Um, that cyberspace, you really need to have a multi-stakeholder approach to adequately address cyber threats because they are virtual, because they affect uh, the technology infrastructure that all of us depend, and because they are so critical to how increasingly we, we go about our daily lives that you really, really have to involve uh, not just the security sector in, in responding to the threat. So some, some, some uh, plaudits to all of you for highlighting those aspects. So um, we're going to go through each of you one more time and then hopefully one more time again to, to respond to the poll or, or any other questions or, or, or one another. Um, let's start with you, Kamal. Um, then we'll go to Nana, then we'll end, then we'll go to Nana, then we'll end with Michael. So come on, do you have any, any, um, any uh, reactions? You want? Oui, uh, bien entendu, yes, of course, I have reactions. I will start on the question of, uh, in terms of the uh, balance between uh, respecting uh, liberty and human rights and, and in terms of the organization of the United States, of the United Nations, we are very concerned with this. And I would like to uh, take advantage of this moment to say that we are sometimes challenged. Uh, we, we sometimes uh, want to ensure that we are truly respecting or we encourage other, our partners to respect these questions of human rights in all of our work, in all of the assistance that we bring to countries in the fight against cybercrime. So my answer, uh, the answer is all of our trainings, is in our trainings, all of our trainings have a module on human rights. We ha do not have a, any training without insisting on the importance of preserving human rights and enforcing them and how uh, law enforcement and the magistrates and the judges must in their daily work, they must ensure that uh, the human rights are preserved, that people should be proven guilty or considered innocent until proven guilty. And this is something that we uh, is, is a part of all of our training and all assistance that we bring to uh, the states if we are asked to, to provide materials or, or uh, software in term to fight cyber crime we we hardly uh supply software but that that could be used for any reason other than that which was asked for we make sure of that so we want to ensure that the material that we are sharing can really uh, to fight cybercrime will also um, ensure that human rights will remain in the forefront of of any action taken and and this any assistance that we provide insists upon that thank you thank you uh nana over to you I will touch upon um, efforts being made to encourage African states to ratify the Malabo Convention or adopt recommendations. First, I want to say that I think what you then have in Africa is rather a situation where states pick and choose what they want to ratify or not, because of course you cannot tell African states, you can't tell states based on sovereignty what to do. It is not just limited to Malabo Convention. There are certain conventions as well that you find African states are reluctant to ratify. But then you see when it touches upon economic issue like the African Free Trade Agreement, states are eager to ratify. 
But what I want to say is that the African Union itself has been making efforts. For example, myself and Michael are members of the African Union Cybersecurity Experts Group. And one of the things that is the core of our mandate is to push for a ratification. There are so many conversations going on as to the ratification. Again, what you begin to see is states saying that, you know, um, this, should be, um, this should be revised. And I always say, we need to look at Article 37 of the Malabo Convention, which says that if it comes into force, it can be revised. The Budapest Convention was drafted in 2001. It's 20 years, and there is still an additional protocol being added to it. So there are efforts being go going on rather by the African Union. It's not that states are not aware of these conventions. We also find that they are not ratifying the Budapest Convention in itself. So there is usually every year, the African Union in collaboration with the Council of Europe has hosted an African Union Cybercrime Forum. It happens every year. At the just concluded ministerial or heads of state summit, we are told that it's one of the agendas that will be addressed. Um, next month in March, there is going to be a declaration as well in Lume, a cybersecurity declaration. So there are efforts, you have meetings, and you know, talking about this going, uh, talking about this on and on in every meeting, but then they have their issues, they also have their challenges. But it's not that there is no effort. So far, we have 10 ratifications. The Togolese parliament has um, advised the government to also ratify, and we just need four more um, ratifications, and the Malabo Convention will come into force. And we are hopeful that that will happen soon, and we can have a harmonized approach. But most importantly, also focus on international agreements as well. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Michael, over to you. Um, I'll address the questions. Uh, I'll actually address two of them. Uh, the first one borders on human rights. So let's agree to, to disagree that there is no legal framework that will not bring issues of human rights to the front. As the law in itself stands, there's no better law that will be praised for being a better law without human rights issues being brought to the front. The second one has to do with the Budapest Convention. So basically, if you look at um, the letter at which African nations are uh, enacting cyber registration, it is a sorry sight. I think this in itself has led us to where we are right now when it comes to law numbers in African nations in ratifying the Budapest uh, Convention and the African uh, Convention on Cyber Security and Data Protection, common known as the Malabo Convention. So basically, if you look at the nations in Africa, how many African countries have cybersecurity laws and data protection laws? Compare that number, countries that have ratified the Malabo Convention, I think it will tell us one story. A country that has no cyber law, I don't think they will have interest to ratify the Malabo Convention, which speaks to laws that they do not have domestically. Just on a right note, I think we are one of the countries within Africa that has so far ratified the Malabo Convention. We are on the way also as Zambia to ratify the Budapest Convention. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Michael. So we have two further questions and that, that I, I'd like to get maybe addressed. And if, if our panelists kind of want to take one to two minutes to quickly wrap up and then I'll wrap up. So the two questions are, how do you balance um, respecting kind of freedom of speech and civil liberties with the, with the fact that on, honestly information and communication technology offers a very handy way to track and monitor threats from organized criminal networks and, and terrorist groups. You know, it extends the reach of the state. So that's, that's one question. Um, another question is, and I think this is a, a really interesting and, and important one now, is how do you handle the, the difficulty um, of sharing information or getting information from uh, the private sector and in particular multinational tech companies, you know, like Google's, like Facebook uh, or others that are American companies, but, but that are operating in Africa and, and not, don't necessarily have a, a large presence in Africa. How do you get uh, cooperation for them and especially keeping the, the need to, to, to respect uh, human rights in mind? Does, does anybody, Wanna, uh, I'd like to get at each of you a minute or two and then we can end up. Does anybody want to address that question? So, Nana, I see you. You have unmuted yourself, then we'll go to Michael. 
Thank you. And thanks to the person who asked that very important question. Um, I'm a member of the International Law Digital, International Law Association Digital Challenges um, for International Law. And last week we were having conversations with someone who used to be in Google. And one of the questions I asked her was, do states, you know, partner with data companies or tech companies in you know even engaging in cyber enabled crimes and you know she talked about some of the modalities in terms of cooperation now one thing michael talked about which i could rephrase as prioritization first and foremost you can't even talk about partnering with multi companies when you yourself you've not prioritized cyber security in your region or in your state there is no multinational corporation uh, company that would work with you in relation to data when you do not have agreements, policies, or framework in place. Now, if you look at the Budapest Convention, for example, it tells you how states are mandated to work with each other where there is cooperation and even where there are no such agreements in place. So without you know, structures, you can't talk about involving multinational. And these corporations need Africa. We just sometimes assume that they are not interested. They need us because if you look at statistics, the number of crimes emanating from the African region sometimes outweighs what you see in the places where you think cooperation is important. But then our leaders are not interested. There is no prioritization of security issues. We do not have the capacity as well and the knowledge and awareness. So when we understand this, we can then understand that it is, and I talked about it when I was um, answering Nate's questions about involvement of private sectors. Our strategies need to recognize that we need them. However, what you have, and we know very well, Nigeria, for example, is fighting Twitter on and on. The other day it was about Twitter being one-sided and what have you. So we should rather think of how to cooperate with these international tech companies rather than always finding loopholes. It's not beneficial to us. And in terms of finding a balance, I touched upon it when I asked the question. It's an unfortunate situation. The same technology that is being, we are saying that people's rights should be protected because of it's also an avenue to infringe other people's rights. Freedom of speech, for example, could be an opportunity to spread misinformation, disinformation. And so, but I always say that rather than you shutting down internet access for people just because you suspect misinformation, think of developing capacity to enable investigation and law enforcement. I know we can't get there. We can't develop into stages of development. We can't advance into stages of development just as it is in other places. But let's rather think of you know, finding the right balance. How do we develop our set systems, emergency response systems? Are we developing skills for those who are responsible in these sectors rather than always shutting down the internet or saying, because we think the internet is just being used by a bunch of youths without thinking that the internet also facilitates human rights obligations. So it must be done on basis of legitimate aims, national uh, necessity and proportionality as well. Thank you, Nate. Thank you for that. Excellent. Um, Michael and then uh, Kamal for any brief interventions you might have to conclude. Uh, just a minute or two. Michael, why don't you come uh, okay. in? Yeah. Uh, basically, Nena has addressed the first part of the question so well that I don't think I can add or subtract what she said. I will basically restrict my response to the next question about uh, international cooperation between countries and uh, these private organizations, private companies who keep um, people's data or when we make data requests, how cooperative uh, do we get with them? So basically I'll put, I'll answer this question in two fold. When you talk of um, cooperation, it's our weight both on the national aspect of it and the international aspect of it. So I'll start on the national aspect. On the national front, most companies, ISPs and other organizations that hold data of evidential value or anything that a law enforcement officer wants during the course of investigation, I think that cooperation has been well, well managed in the case of Zambia. We are able to request for information and um, get it within the stipulated time frame. However, the problem comes in when you want to get information from these multinational companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and many other that offer a service uh, globally. Among us, uh, on all of them, I think Google, uh, I think uh, Facebook has tried their best in terms of um, giving law enforcement 
the necessary information which is needed whenever a request or a warrant is or a subpoena is saved on them. However, many of them, they are a little bit, it's, it's a little bit difficult because what they may deem to be an illegal act, what we may deem to be an illegal act here in Zambia, the companies based on the laws on the international scene, probably in the US, may not deem it to be something that is sensitive enough or serious enough for them to release information. So basically that is where we find it a little bit tricky and difficult. What may be offensive in terms of uh, uh, freedom of speech here, that, what, that which we criminalize here, probably in the US, they don't criminalize it. As a result, when you request for information to be given on the user or an account using that account to commit such a crime, it is literally almost impossible for them to give you, because to them, they feel like you're abusing the system. And yet in your country, that is in itself is an illegal act. So basically we need a situation where when we approach these uh, multinational organization, I know most of them, they've created portals for law enforcement agencies to push in their data requests, subpoenas and warrants, but I think that is not enough. There's need to engage each country and understand the laws within those jurisdictions to ensure that whatever is requested is given. Of course, it's prone to abuse, but basically it must be in line with the legal framework of that particular country. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Kamal, any concluding thoughts? We, uh, merci et yes, thank you. And first of all, congratulations to my co-panelists uh, who have truly uh, given a comprehensive uh, overview of the subject. Now, there are two items. First, countries that ask, that request information. Within those countries, uh, sometimes things are not structured in the proper manner or well organized. Uh, in terms of the feedback that we've received from a number of countries when we've attempted on our end as well to, to talk about this cooperation, the response we've had is that Many countries do not comply with the format that is required in order to uh, make the request. Certain, certain uh, companies have a law enforcement uh, page on, on their website, and they will list uh, the various processes that must be carried out in order to obtain information. A simple example, when you write uh, to an international company like Facebook, and, and you use an address that is not a government address that does not end with point .gov, gov, or it say you, you use a Yahoo or Gmail address, they're not going to answer you. So it is really up to the countries first to do what is required to obtain a response by going to the websites of the companies, by researching the criteria that must be complied with in order to obtain a response. Now, on our side, Michael uh, answered this really well. When you comply with all of that and that, then you send your request, they on their and what's considered as an offense in your country is perhaps not considered to be an offense in, in their country. So you have to look at the laws. So, and so you know, for example, there are countries that apply the death penalty. Uh, they, 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 so they, they look, if there is no, nothing clearly written, they have to, you know, base their, their decision to respond on many factors. To conclude, certain countries have told me that they, when they write in, they obtain responses, certain African countries, and others have told me they never get a response. So we encourage African countries to respect, to comply with the criteria that are applied to to these requests so if they have complied with all the criteria if they've used a government email address if they've identified themselves explained the reason for which they need this information and if then they do not receive information then they can ask for an explanation to to understand why they did not 
get any response. But I, I must say, it is an issue where there is a lot of, there are a lot of complaints because um, many countries, the day there are you know the, the greatest number of countries do not receive a response um so for the most countries you know if if you write to an official uh within uh, african countries you get a response with a yahoo email address or a gmail address so i think the countries themselves should start to establish uh, standards for this and and then uh, hope that they can improve this international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for, as Kamal said to all three of you, for really wonderful interventions. And I think, I think between the three of you, you gave a really, really comprehensive overview of the key deficits and challenges across the African security sector and even government more broadly in responding to cyber-enabled organized crime and, and what needs to be done in order to, to, to meet the threat. Um, and there, there, I'd like to briefly share two, I always learn things from these webinars and there were two really big things that stood out to me today that I'd just like to foot stomp on briefly before we conclude today's webinar. First, you know, there seems to be a, a consensus at least that capacity building is, is perhaps the most significant threat. But if anything, this conversation made it clear to me how much synergy there is between the need for just capacity building in terms of technical expertise and capacity building on the policy and legal side. Um, why? Because as Michael, I think, said in his opening remark, you can't prosecute a crime that isn't defined and still lots of cyber crimes are on the books. Um, you can't cooperate to address a crime threat that doesn't exist in another country, as Kamal just said in his last remark about the challenges of, of trans-border cooperation. Um, you can't even cooperate with a multinational corporation who are essential in, in addressing a lot of these threats, um, kind of as, as first responders and, and on their networks, without having basic cybersecurity policy and legal form, frameworks in, in, in place. So there really is a, a, a synergy between kind of the basic capacity building that needs to get done, but also all of the, the may big legal and policy frameworks that as sort of leaders um, need, need, to, need to take place at, at a continental level and at a national level. Um, the other thing that, that I'd like to really highlight on for me is the need to focus more than we have here at the Africa Center and maybe elsewhere on the need for security sector cooperation in addressing cyber-enabled organized crime and particularly cooperation between the security sector and, and the justice sector. Um, there are a lot of really important elements here, including you know, the challenges of interagency coordination when say gendarmeries and, and, and other police units might be competing for the same turf, um, when it comes to maybe potentially informal coordination between and across security sector actors in different countries. And of course, I, one of the things I think that, that, that um, I think it was Kamal mentioned about how, or maybe, maybe it was Michael, that, that um, you need capacity to deal with, with the threat, which, which merits to having some kind of centralized institution, be it a computer emergency response team or, or, or a coordination center, a national coordination center, which we're seeing proliferating, really be your government's focal point. So there's a need both of communication, but also consolidation, I think, across the security sector and government in some really, really interesting ways that, that just showcase how, how unique and different uh, cyber-related threats and challenges are. Um, and then finally, and, and briefly, because I think we talk about this pretty consistently in all of our, our webinars, but it's still, I think, important to highlight, um, we all have to recognize that citizen security, cybersecurity, and multi-stakeholder cooperation in cyberspace are synergistic and necessary. I think really the only way that our nations, um, African countries, are going to address these increasingly globalized threats from cyber-enabled crime are through cooperation uh, between and within the security sector, with government agencies, with external partners, with the private sector, and of course, um, civil society, which is a crucial party, but is all too often uh, forgotten in these conversations. So we'll end the webinar right there uh, a little bit over time. Many thanks to our three panelists for their really brilliant interventions, concise remarks, very, very well presented. Uh, to our audience members, 
Um, please feel free if you have any comments or feedback or questions that you didn't feel get addressed or would like to be a speaker or any any for any reason you want to get in touch with us. Uh, please, feel, please feel free to get in touch with me or to get in touch with CAA or to, or to state your remarks in the chat. As I said in my last remark, we are here as a resource um, here at the Africa Center for all of you. Um, and, and thank you, thank you so much. Um, I look forward to continuing uh, the conversation.